that is what this series is going to be all about. The story of the events and the people who over centuries came together to bring us in from the cold and to wrap us in a warm blanket of technology is a matter of vital importance. I take going up in the world like that for granted. We all do. And as the years of the 20th century have gone by, the things we take for granted have multiplied way beyond the ability of any individual to understand in a lifetime. Down there is one of the biggest, most complex cities in the world, full of people using things as if they understood them, and sometimes not even knowing they're doing it. New York City, like all the other major high-density population centers scattered across the Earth, is a technology island. I'd like you to meet a few people who were in or near New York City on a November evening over a decade ago. And the reason I'd like you to meet them is because they all have one thing in common. They were all brought to a sudden and catastrophic realization of how vulnerable they were, how dependent on one aspect of that technological network I was talking about. Ten past five, Mount Sinai Hospital. Fair enough, I'm just giving him an option and I'm having to anyway. Okay. The patient, Mrs. Marcana, is expecting twins. 5.15 at Kennedy Airport. At one of the international terminals, on the board, Scandinavian Airlines 911. Scandinavian 911 is on its way into Kennedy. The pilot is veteran Captain Carl Lofsted. Kennedy Airport Control, Scandinavian 911. With information, Yankee. 5,000 feet approaching Greenland. Scandinavian 911, right here, parked here, parked on 221 radio vector, final runway 4 right ILS. Please fasten your seatbelts. Runway lights at 2 o'clock. Okay, I see you. With the next contraction, Dave, you'll take a deep breath and push real hard, okay? I think one is about to start. Take a deep breath and push real hard. Okay. At Mount Sinai Hospital, Mrs. Marcana is in labor. Okay, fair. I think you can put her asleep now. Fair enough. The anesthetic being used at the time is a mixture of gases, including one called cyclopropane. It's potentially explosive. But everybody knows that. Okay, we've got a baby. It's now exactly 16 minutes and 10 seconds past five. That's where this comes in. It's a relay, and its job is to detect changes in power going onto a transmission line. These up here. Power flows north along these lines. And on the particular evening in question, this relay detected an increase in power on one of those lines that was above a preset limit. When that happened, magnets set around this metal cup caused it to rotate, and that brought this arm to make a contact like this. That contact was made on the evening of November the 9th, 1965, at 16 minutes and 11 seconds past five. As the network fell apart, links between one energy center and another broke. Instead of 300,000 kilowatts coming into New York to help meet demand, one and a half million kilowatts were draining out of the city to supply areas now cut off from the network, but still connected like leeches to the New York generators. Here we go again. Okay, I'm What the hell's going on? Kennedy Airport, the radar screens went black. And flight 911 was in trouble. Uh, Roland, I got flight warning. Switch number two to the island, okay? You know, I have some candles. I like them. This abnormal business of actually talking to anybody on the subway caught on briefly all over New York. Let's put some light on the situation. My birthday anyway, and if I feel like singing, that birthday birthday. Birthday. <laughs> <laughs> make a happy situation out of a terrible one. My name? Louise? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. But while this journey had taken on a meaning nobody expected, so too, at the hospital, had Mrs. Marcana's delivery of twins, thanks to the anesthetic. There was then a general scurry around to find flashlights. And I immediately commandeered one. 
The extraordinary thing in the subways was that a full hour into the crisis, nobody was trying to escape from the trap. Yeah, it's not even a corkscrew. Would it be cricket to put one in here? Yeah. Okay. Now we needed the knife. Well, the baby was delivered without the lights because you didn't need the lights for the delivery. That, that's manipulative. Remember, you're reaching up into the uterus, grabbing a foot, which is strictly by feel. You rupture the membranes and you bring the foot down. The second baby was vigorous, and uh, we repaired the uh, piece. For such a pretty girl. Yeah. Captain Lusted had only a few seconds left to make his decision. He was at 2,000 feet, past the airport, and heading straight for Manhattan in the darkness. There was only one thing he could do. Lusted and 200 other jets that night landed with the help of radio working on planes sitting on the ground. And finally, as in all good fairy stories, it was over. A few days later, people were back at their daily routine as if it had never happened. The night New York became a trap forgotten. woman the compulsory sheltering and feeding of an extra eight people for the family who have fled this house the immediate requisition of their home for this man perhaps imprisonment if he refuses to bill it in a recent mock NATO battle in Europe, using only tactical nuclear weapons and described as a limited engagement, it was estimated that over two million non-combatants would have been fatally or seriously injured. David Edward Thornley, age 37, general practitioner in medicine, now on the staff of one of a series of emergency medical aid units being established in preparation for a nuclear strike. Time, 9.11 a.m., September the 18th. Dr. Thornley stops to make an emergency call. Berwick Street, Canterbury. Twelve miles from the airfield at Manston on the Kent coast. couldn't afford to build themselves a refuge. This could be the way the last two minutes of peace in Britain would look. latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago, was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing. And indeed it has. Apparently that's only a few hundred yards away from where the World Trade Center towers were. And it seems that this was not a result of a new attack. It was because the uh, building had been weakened uh, during this morning's attacks. We'll probably find out more now about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? Presumably there were very few people in the Salomon building when it collapsed. I mean, th there were, I suppose, fears of possible further collapses around the area. 
That's what you would hope because this whole downtown area behind me has been completely sealed off and evacuated apart from the emergency workers. That was done by the mayor, Rudy Giuliani, uh, much earlier today uh, because of, the course, the dreadful collapse of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. But uh, New York very much a city still in chaos. The phones are not working properly. The subway lines are not working properly. And we know that down there near the World Trade Center, there are three schools that um, are being turned into triage centers for emergency treatment. And I... Jane, I think many of us, when we heard the news, perhaps on the radio earlier today, were uh, completely flabbergasted by it and, and just couldn't un comprehend it. I mean, it, was, it almost sounded too far-fetched. Um, I was wondering what it felt like for you being in Manhattan. Well, unfortunately, I think we've lost the line with uh, Jane Stanley in Manhattan. Perhaps we can rejoin her and follow that up later.